Lutheran Memorial Church and School from the Church of the Confession, the CLC. As you notice, we don't have organists today, not because we don't have organists, but we're giving the two that we have a break. And as we've done before, we're singing an a cappella service. So I will do my best to lead us in that music that we are familiar with. We'll begin this morning's worship service with prayer. O Lord God, we come together to hear your holy word. That through the hearing of your word, we may be brought to repent of our sins, to believe on Jesus in life and in death, and to grow day by day in your grace and holiness. Hear us now, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. We begin on the top of page two or on the projection screen in front of you. And we begin our worship service today in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And we pray. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. We'll begin with hymn 20, and I will hum the, the first line of that, and then you can join in for those first two verses with me. Uh, Oh Lord God, 
Do you see that of ourselves we have no strength? Keep us both outwardly and inwardly, that we may be delivered from all adversities which may happen to the body, and from all evil which may afflict our souls. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first scripture lesson from the Old Testament, we see recorded here a command from the Lord as we look at a number of different commandments being talked about, not just the second commandment when it comes to keeping God's word and truth and purity, but also to following the first commandment. The second commandment's warning here, we see the judgment of the Lord is on the person who rejects the Lord and turns to other gods. Notice that when we break the second commandment, we are also breaking that first commandment. All sin, as we see in verse 6, is adultery with the Lord. But don't miss the gospel in which he says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you. It is the Lord who covers our sin in Christ. And the person who turns to medians, fortune tellers, that is, and familiar spirits, to prostitute himself with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. Consecrate yourselves, therefore, and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. That word sanctify again means to set apart. To set us apart from wickedness, from godlessness. To continue to consecrate us as a holy people of God who love him, his words, and his truth. In our second scripture lesson, we see this truth once again in God's purpose of the gospel, that good news of Christ. And despite great conflict in our lives, the gospel stirs them up, up in our hearts in our Lord and knits us together in God's word with like-minded believers. Paul warns about the dangers of following the philosophers of the world which reject God and his wise plan of salvation, which is fulfilled in Christ. As we look here in this section, look at what this treasure of God's word can do for us in our faith and fellowship in Christ. Begin with verse 1. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. It is that word of God that establishes our faith and confession and what Jesus has done for us and his words to us. And so we use the words of the second article about redemption in Christ. We rise boldly to make that confession of our faith in him. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten from the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me, a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy, precious blood, and with his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own, and live under him in his kingdom, and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, 
lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. We continue with our hymn of the day, hymn 318. Please be seated. persistent. 
He sits there and waits patiently to be fed. Today we're talking not about dogs in the sermon, but we're talking about people who patiently wait for Jesus to feed them also. In our lesson today, we're talking about a specific woman who is not a Jew, who is not one of the chosen people of God that the Savior would come from, but yet she sits at Jesus' table, so to speak, patiently asking over and over for the Lord to help her. What do we call that when we ask the Lord for something? Praying. A praying is just like asking our parents for something. How many of you ask your parents for things over and over and over and over again? What are you trying to do besides wear them down? You ask them over and over because you really want something. Maybe you really need something. And so you ask and you ask. Maybe one day after another. When we pray to the Lord, there's many times he wants us to ask over and over too. He wants us to be persistent in our prayers. And he wants us to have that attitude and that trust that he hears our prayers and that he will answer them. What is the greatest thing that Jesus has answered for us? What is the greatest request? We can't say, God never answers my prayers. What's the best thing that Jesus has answered for us? What do you think? Feeds our faith. He forgives us. And what's the best thing that we're patiently waiting for today? Heaven. What a wonderful thing that we're sitting at Jesus' table again today to be fed through his word as we patiently wait for his promises. Our prayers to go to heaven. Our prayers for forgiveness. Our prayers for our daily needs. Jesus is going to give us what we need. He's going to answer our prayers. As we see what Jesus did on the cross... He's already answered that greatest prayer request of all, that we can spend eternal life in our master's house with him. So let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, help us to continue to beg each day for your love, for your mercy, for forgiveness, and recognize you have given it to us freely. Bless us again today as we are nourished and strengthened through your word of life. In your saving name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to each one of you today, sitting at our Master's table, each one of us, ready to hear what God's Word intends for our souls, for the satisfaction of our hearts today, as we rejoice that we are even in God's house and at His table today. Our text for consideration is from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 7. A little bit of the background on this is that it's in the final year of Jesus' ministry here on earth, fitting as we go through this season of Lent, examining the path that Jesus took to the cross for us, and fitting in the sense that it really deals with an important issue of our day and age today. What's going on among our society, what we also can be very guilty of from time to time. It's that word, entitlement. What does that word entitlement mean? We might all define it differently, but entitlement basically has the idea that I should get what I deserve. I am entitled to it. Can you imagine if I said to you, I am entitled for this or that as your pastor? This is what I deserve. That attitude would be very unloving, wouldn't it? This idea of entitlement is really rooted in every area of our life. Whether we think we deserve certain things from the government, or we think we deserve certain things from our neighbors, or we think we deserve certain things from our family, from our spouse or our children, entitlement is all around us. It plagues us, our society, and our church. What does the Word of God remind us today about that word entitlement? 
Jesus is in a house in Tyre and Sidon. As he's getting closer to the time of his departure, he's trying to stay away from the crowds because, as we know, the crowds are starting to consider him such a wonderful earthly king that could provide miraculously for their bread. They were thinking of him as an earthly bread king, and in their entitlement they think, if he can bring us from five loaves of bread and two fish, an abundance of food for tens of thousands, think of what he can do for all of our material possessions. Was there a sense of entitlement with some of Jesus' early disciples, those who followed along with him? Absolutely. Jesus was trying to avoid the crowds because he needed to get back to Jerusalem and he needed to continue to share the gospel of what he was really there for, the good news of why he had really come. And so we see in our text, he's journeying along the coastland, the area of Tyre and Sidon, and he comes across a house where he's teaching some of his disciples. Word gets out, crowds come, Jesus does his healing once again and continues to preach the word of God. But in our text today, we see a peculiar woman that comes to Jesus. We're going to learn more about what this woman's background is. And I want you to follow along with me and answer the question in your own mind, was this woman entitled? Let's see what the Word of God says for us. From the Gospel of Mark chapter 7, beginning with verse 24. From there Jesus arose and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, And he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit, that is a demon, heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out, and her daughter lying on the bed. This is the word of God for our instruction today, and so we pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. As I mentioned in the children's sermon, I think we'd all agree that typically persistence pays off. Maybe we think that our persistence works well when we can be annoying enough to annoy someone to death where they actually give us what they want. So often in our whole household, I'm convinced that's what the children are trying to do to me. Annoy me to death, so I finally, yes, finally take it. Play video games, watch a movie, I don't care. Is that what we see from this woman in our text? Our theme for today is to beg Jesus for his blessings, but not in an annoying way. Not with an attitude of entitlement, not with an attitude that, Lord, I expect all these things in my life. If you're going to call me your child, Lord, then I should get all these things that I want in my life. That's why the first portion of our meditation says our begging begins under the table persistently asked in honesty and humility. As we look at that word entitlement, it's really a foreign concept in times of famine. There are days that I wish I would have lived through the Great Depression. Let me emphasize, lived through it. Was there entitlement in our society at that time? It was survival. It was hopeful that we had a meal for the next day. It reminds me of a Bible verse from 2 Thessalonians that my mother would often remind me growing up when it came to doing chores around the house. Neil, he who does not work, neither should he eat. (laughs) I'm your your son, Mom. Of course you're going to feed me. Now there are times where she did not. We see that entitlement in our society today. And we recognize this idea that we don't have to work and we deserve all the different things that others can give us. If you look at this Syrophoenician woman, the first question you might ask is, what does that mean? Syrophoenician means three things. One is that she was Greek by religion. She believed in the Greek mythology. 
She was of a Syrian tongue or language, so she spoke from the Assyrian dialect, and she was Phoenician by race. This woman heard about Jesus and went to him for help. Even though she had this background, she went and requested Jesus' help. Now, if you're a Jew living in those times, and typically were very proud and very arrogant about their nationality, that they were descendants of Abraham, that they were promised the promised Messiah. This Syrophoenician was a mutt, was a dog that did not deserve to be following Jesus, that did not deserve the gospel. She can have all the entitlement she wants. She will not be one of us. Yet that woman kept on asking Jesus, didn't she? If you go back to verse 26, that's exactly what the Greek says there. The woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. That was her request. That was her prayer. In fact, if you go to the Gospel of Matthew, it's rather interesting. Matthew wrote the Gospel for the Jewish people. Mark wrote it for behalf of the Gentiles. And actually, Matthew is a a better, more spread out, more detailed account. Because Matthew explains what happens with this relationship between the Jews and this Syrophoenician woman. If you go back to Matthew 15, 23, the disciples said to this persistent woman who kept calling out after Jesus, Lord, help me. They said, send her away. Basically, she's annoying us. Jesus was not responding to her requests, almost like he was ignoring her. And finally, they said to him, just get her out of here. Tired of listening to her whine and complain about her daughter. This foreign woman continues to seek after Jesus because what she realized is what Jesus offered could not be found anywhere else. She came to Jesus in faith. She came to Jesus trusting what he could do for her. She came already believing who he said he was, the Son of God. And her persistence to that Son of God, Lord, help me, help me, help me, over and over. That persistence was not entitled because we see in how Jesus responds to her over and over, pleading for his help. In verse 27, Jesus says, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. That kind of sounds unloving. That's your Savior. It almost sounds like he's saying, Get out of here, lady. I should be helping the children first, the children of God, the Jewish people first. But he was testing her with that question. He was testing his disciples and us today with that question. Who is the gospel meant for? Who is the word of God? Who is God's power meant for? The woman responds and says, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Her persistence in asking the Lord was in humility, was in her humble mind, knowing the word of God said that the gospel, the Messiah, was meant for the Jews first. Yet she knew Enough about the true God that that love was beyond the Jewish race, the Jewish people. And that the little dogs, the the foreign nations, the ones that were serving other gods, the gospel was also meant for them too. It wasn't entitlement she was seeking. She was seeking mercy in her humility. She was seeking help for her daughter, trusting that this was the Messiah, trusting that in faith he could help her, believing Are we so different? Would we not behave just like that woman? Do we not behave just like that woman when one of our loved ones falls ill? What extent would you go to help your child get a cure that they needed? I'm not talking about demon possession here. I'm talking about any cure. Would you fly to the other side of the world to help your loved one, your spouse, your child, your closest friend? Would you drive the distance of our nation to go to a specialized doctor to find that cancer treatment? Yes! Would you persistently pray to your father, trusting like this woman did, that he could help her? 
Never mind the doctors or physicians or the priests that had no success in casting out that demon of her daughter. She was not entitled. She was humbly asking for help because she could do nothing on her own. Where does honesty and humility get us in this life? Jesus reminds us those who ask, seek, and knock, he will answer. He will provide us an answer, usually not when we want to, just like this woman. He allowed her to persistently ask, to teach the disciples, to remind her of a lesson about patience, about trust, about entitlement. And that lesson went on for the disciples to show them that this woman understood it. She got it. The love of the gospel, the love of Christ was meant for all. Our begging begins under the table with this same humility, with this same honesty about our sin, that we are outcasts from God, we are exiled, we are without Christ apart from his word. And so our begging, our prayers need to begin in that same humility, not with entitlement. Dear Lord, I deserve this raise. Dear Lord, I deserve my wife to treat me well, my children to honor and respect me. Dear Lord, me, me, me. We need to do a prayer check, don't we? Examine our heart and recognize how sinful our own ideas and entitlement become each and every day. We turn to the Lord persistently asking for that forgiveness, for that mercy just like this woman did in faith. We beg Jesus for his blessings, secondly, because our begging ends, doesn't it? With the children's bread. Our begging ends as the Lord consistently provides. He can consistently gives to us what we need. Entitlement, as I mentioned, is not so foreign concept in our own homes, in our own lives. 1 Timothy 6 reminds us of the opposite of entitlement, contentment. He reminds us that now godliness with contentment is great gain. For as certain we've brought nothing into this world, as just as certain we can carry nothing out. With food and clothing, with these, anybody remember? We shall be content. What a blessing that we realize that the Lord gives us all that we need to support this body and life. What a blessing is that we can see through this woman that she was seeking something for her child, but seeking it in faith. The riches that she sought, she had already learned about Jesus as her Lord, the one who had power over it. How do we know that the woman had faith in Jesus? Again, go back to Matthew 15. After all this persistence and Jesus responding, he said to the woman, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done as you requested. Jesus, you got to prove it to me. You need to show me right now. At the word of God, what did she do? In verse 30, And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. She left Jesus in faith. She didn't make him prove it to her. She didn't have that idea of entitlement that you got to show me right now the answer to my prayer, Lord. She went out in faith and found it as she had hoped, as the Lord had promised her daughter well, cured from that horrible demon. The Lord had answered her prayer. We come into God's house with the baggage of entitlement, the baggage of expectations of others in our lives. We come to hear the mercy of Christ, recognize we don't deserve any of the gifts that we've been given, and yet he restores us and gives us that same love and mercy that we see throughout his ministry. We come in as sinners, and we go out as redeemed children of God. We come in by faith, praying before the service, praying that the Lord would teach us, instruct us, comfort us with his love, comfort us with his mercy, give us peace in this very restless life. And we leave filled with the good news of Christ. We leave God's house being fed, even if it's the scraps on the table, as Gentile Christians ourselves. What a blessing 
that as we come to God's house, our prayers end with the belief that he will answer those prayers. Just as the children understood that he has done once and for all on the cross. Just as he reminds us that we have that heavenly gift because he's conquered death for us. Because he lives, we will live also. He is the resurrection, the life. The greatest prayer you could ever ask, your Lord has answered. And you come to his house to be filled with this message again. And he signs a seat for you. He gives you a setting so that you would take and eat that the Lord is good. And he has answered your prayers once and for all. If the Lord has done that, you can come to him any time in your life through prayer, in humility, in honesty, and recognize in that trust in the Lord that he will be with you that he will answer your prayers according to his will and not our own. The message of the cross was for Jew and Gentile alike. The Syrophoenician woman got it. The disciples, we pray, learned it after that. And we pray this morning that we would treasure that as well so that we don't hold that gospel of love in, but that we share it with everyone in our life as we continue to show the bread of life in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a blessing it is that we can be here again this morning begging Jesus for his blessings. Not just our day-to-day needs or wants, but begging him to show again, to create in us a clean heart, to show us that gift of eternal life. Let us continue over and over again, persistently begging Jesus for his word of life as we hear again today how he consistently has answered our prayers. Amen. Please rise. May this peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard and keep your hearts and your minds in our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue on the top of page five with the offertory. Create in me a clean heart.
again for answering our prayers. Uh, this past week, Ron Lanker had another knee surgery, and it was very successful. No infection was found there, and so he's on the road to recovery, and they have scheduled the next knee surgery for August of the other leg. So the family is very thankful, and we can continue to rejoice in the Lord once again. We also pray for Priscilla Sill's husband, Milton, who had to be taken down to the Madison area for some heart uh, problems that he was going through and some different chemical problems in his body. So we ask the Lord to continue to be with him and comfort him and provide the needs that he has today. And also comfort Priscilla as she goes through this process of praying to the Lord for his deliverance. With these prayers in our general prayer for today, let us pray. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, bring us to the understanding that you have the whole world in your hand. That none of us lives to ourselves, and no one dies to himself. For we are yours, and all is yours. Grant, therefore, that we may see that our highest blessing is ours as we believe in you. And in him you have sent as Savior of the world, our Lord Jesus. We thank you, Father, that you have graciously provided for our forgiveness and salvation through our Lord Jesus, who died as our substitute to take on your full wrath against sin and for despising your law. May we ever live together with Jesus in all that we say and all that we do. And now, O Lord, in the name of him who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all shame and iniquity, help us to walk in obedience to your commandments, to test all things, and to hold fast to that which is good and true, and to abstain from every form of evil. And since you will have all to be saved, and to come to the knowledge of the truth, therefore we ask that you stir up your church to send willing workers to preach the gospel at home and abroad, Give to your believers the heart and vision to pray, to give, and to labor for the salvation of people everywhere, even in our own homes. We pray for all people, especially for those in authority, that they may have respect for your holy will. For all that do not know Jesus as Savior, that they may hear and believe the gospel. For all who are in danger, that they may be preserved from harm. Grant that our homes may be the dwelling places of your Spirit, and lead all within our homes to increase and abound in love toward one another. To all mothers, give the grace of spiritual wisdom. To all fathers, give the gift of a good conscience and wise leadership by example. And to all children, a spirit of cheerful obedience. O Lord, have mercy also upon all those who are in your house this day. Forgive our transgressions. Support the weak. Correct those who have gone astray. And grant us your help for any evil or trouble that plagues our souls or bodies. We give you thanks for being with both Ron and Milt. We ask you to continue to bless them in their hour of need and in their recovery according to your will. Comfort them and their families knowing that you will never leave them or forsake them. And bless them and the doctors as they go forward under your direction. All these things we ask in the name of your son Jesus who gave his life as a ransom for us all that, we might bring us, that he might bring us to you in heaven. By his grace we rise to pray the prayer that he has taught us.
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive with believing hearts the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We conclude our worship in God's house today by singing the last verse of our opening hymn. to rejoice in what his word is for us and for our daily life. Obviously a little bit different service with the a cappella. Kind of takes me back to days before you know, they had the music and things. Well, not that they didn't have music, but I think you know what I mean. The more I try to explain it, the more it won't make sense. Uh, if you look in your bulletin on page 6, um, there's a couple announcements. We do have our midweek Lenten service. Uh, this week, Pastor Matthew Udy is coming over from Marcazan uh, for our Return from Exile series, The Lenten Journey. Also, this coming Saturday, we have that sign painting party here at church at 1 o'clock. There's information on the bulletin board. Also, if you're looking to pick out one of those uh, signs to do, uh, you need to pick that out today so that um, Jesse Shabrell can get that all, all the materials presented. If you want to do that, Erin will be in my office at the desk there, so just go in there and see her if you need to pick out what you want to do for that day. So today's the last day to sign up for that if you're going to. Um, oh, that was one of the announcements. On the bulletin board, there's sign-ups for the Easter brunch as well as our fellowship hour the first week of every month. Please sign up where you can help. We are in need of a couple people to host our fellowship hour next week as well as help with our Easter brunch on April 1st. So again, lots of sign-ups there. Uh, many hands make light the work, and it's definitely a work that is very enjoyable too. So hope you can help out with that. Also, I didn't make the bulletin, but we do have an elders meeting at 6.30 on Tuesday. Uh, so elders, please be here for that. Um, and I think that's... The main announcements there, you can look at, oh, next Sunday, I do need to announce it. We have to have announced two Sundays. Uh, you, so, you probably heard this past Wednesday, Pastor Caleb Shaw returned the call to serve here, which means uh, a week from this Sunday after the service, we'll be having another call meeting. So there's uh, plenty other uh, available men on the list. And so we'll just see, we'll patiently wait and call upon the Lord once again, just like we heard today, for the Lord to respond according to his will, what the answer is. So as long as we have that attitude in our hearts, why won't he continue to give us the things that we need for his daily work? Are there any other announcements that I'm forgetting for this morning? Yes? Is the council meeting after? Uh, the council meet, needs to meet briefly about the uh, potentially calling a vacancy pastor for any interim that there might be. <coughs> so the document we need to go through. So the council could meet in the conference room for that. Uh, just briefly, that would be all that we need, I think. Any other announcements? May the Lord continue to be with you and bless you as we continue to rejoice in how he answers our prayers. Have a great day. <laughs>